So uh, we know why deep learning works. And, and it's actually like the last talk, which was nice, because it reminds you sometimes people did stuff before 2013, which is when a lot of the neural network stuff you know, took off. And so that doesn't mean you need to take the ideas exactly as they are. But oftentimes, there's a good understanding of why it works. So, so we sort of know why it works. I'll try and justify that. So these slides are not written for someone who knows anything about physics. So usually when I talk to people, it's people that you know, classify dogs and cats and on the internet and that sort of thing. And we tried very hard to explain why deep learning works for someone who doesn't know anything about science. So, so um, I, I think I can justify the following claim, which is what these slides are designed to do, to say, so to, before I do that, actually, I want to start off with why. What does why mean? How would you answer a why question? You know, why do proteins fold? Why does a, uh, an atom spit off an electron at this, this, uh, this OK. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to give it back to you because I need this for the talks I give. I don't know, it was a video. So I'm going to have to get this to read this, to at least know what's in this. I haven't read this. So it's the book of why. OK. So, but but how, how would you answer a why? Some people would answer why deep learning was a causal, model. a causal model. I don't know what the causal properties of quantum mechanics are, but when you get down, there may be issues about how you put a causal model. Um, one answer, of course, that's not causal is it's sort of like the brain. So that, that I actually isn't so sad, but that's one. A different answer might be something technical about the structure of the optimizations. Um, something that if you're, if you're trying to bring together physics and machine learning, that you learn sort of pretty quickly as machine learning and a particular neural network people either are applied mathematicians or sort of engineers that just build stuff and put lots of parameters and hacks and do sort of a little bit of ad hoc, ad hoc stuff and get very impressive results. So when I say works, I mean, in state-of-the-art applications. Computer vision and LP it achieves human level performance. And maybe it doesn't do as well in other areas. So let's say that's what I mean by works. So what do, what do you, how would you answer the question, why does it work? And science, of course, has a well-defined MO to answer why questions. I mean, it's causal or it's something. You, 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 you construct an experiment and you make something. You say, I, it, just because you get a positive result doesn't mean anything. You need a control where you change one thing, not a lot of things, one thing, and, and you get the opposite result. You know, so so you, you run a controlled experiment. So I want to talk about why it works in that sense. And, and I'll, so it, it, in some sense, deep learning works because in spite of the fact that it's nominally not convex and things are messy and this and that, um, the training process, when you train to reasonable quality data, engineers in correlations that you squeeze out of the data, correlations over many size scales, um, and those correlations are well modeled by heavy-tailed random matrix theory, and that short circuits all the pathologies of Gaussian spin glasses, and so what you get is a class of models that are sort of convex, essentially, and so you always find the solution. So if you know something about physics and science, you probably nod your head and say, yeah, maybe that makes sense. I want to listen to the details. If you don't know anything about science, but you're from machine learning, you probably say, what did half those words mean? And so most of these slides are written for an audience that's in the latter category, and we tried to operationalize these ideas. Um, and so we're going to use uh, metrics to characterize implicit self-regulation and heavy-tailed self-regulation to answer sort of a why question. Um, so I was going to talk about some stuff using ML in physics models. We have a bunch of results there. Um, and then those are a little less mature, and this is using physics ideas to get better understanding of ML models. Um, and so I ended up deciding to go with this because now we have some results suggest you can use these ideas to port back, which I'm not going to talk about today, but I can talk offline if you want, to say, you know, if, you're have a if, if you want to use neural networks or the machine learning models, um, how would you do that, given that the 99% of people that are in the area are doing convolutions because it's better at predicting cats versus dogs, or doing bidirectionality because it's better for natural languages or whatever. What, what if you wanted to get beyond that and get qualitative insight, like you heard in the last talk? You know, you some, some insight where because you know something about the domain or the physics or the biology. So I'll talk about this. Um, I'll point to slides, but I'll try and describe it, I mean, um, maybe also from a scientific perspective, because I think that's probably a lot of what you um, um, think about and know. So here's a question. Um, so a convex function is a function that um, looks like this. A concave function looks like this, because you know, you're walking to the cave and there's the door to the cave. But a convex function sort of looks like that. Um, so which of the following functions is convex? And you know, 
I didn't define what convexity is, so maybe I'm ignoring that detail, right? I mean, so, and don't speak like a mathematician. You know, just squint at it and say, which of these functions is convex? So that one is, right? This one's not. Is this one? Why not? So it's no better than this one on the left. So you know, one answer is it's not convex. You have a little bump here. Another example is it's not convex because you're not even close to it. I mean, this isn't even close, right? If you have this function, you have a little blip there. You know, it's sort of convex. Maybe you can imagine ignoring that, right? So this is convex not because there's a little blip there, but because you know, you're not even close. Is this function convex? A little bit. So there's a no, there's a little bit, there's someone shaking their heads. So in, in machine learning, oftentimes you write down a function. And this is just philosophy. It's not like in physics where you know, the equations come from, you know, Maxwell writes down electromagnetic equation and Dirac writes down the Dirac. I mean, you just write down equations, but, but you never touch those equations. You never touch those equations because you run stochastic optimization algorithms. So in, in physics, you know there's a difference between an energy and a free energy. An energy is an energy. A free energy is essentially the energy in a statistical mechanical ensemble where you have a lot of noise, so you can never touch the energy. You don't quench it to zero temperature, you quench it to T star. Okay, so now, if I write down an equation, and it looks like that, and the only way I ever touch those equations is via stochastic gradient descent with lots of noise and so on and so forth, is this function convex? And the answer is yes, because you never see that bump, you know, because you have so many knobs you can fill with. So when I say deep learning works because it's engineers in a, a rugged convexity, yeah, yeah, it looks like this. But squint at it, you know, it's going to look like this. Um, now, if I was to measure a metric of non-convexity or a metric of smoothness or a metric of first and second order conditions for optimality, what conditions would I use? I'd probably measure a gradient or a Hessian or something, right? So a gradient or a Hessian will tell me something about this versus that, or this versus that, right? It'll tell me if I'm smooth or if I have these little local bumps, because it'll say something about here. It says absolutely nothing about this versus that. This is really something about the large scale architecture of the configuration space, right? So gradients and Hessians say nothing about this difference. This, whichever way. It can't distinguish this line from that line. Um, so there's a lot of work that says, well, you know, if you get good gradients, if your Hessians are zero, if whatever, you gotta get good generalization. And this is a little bit strange because they don't depend on the data. We'll see that data will d allow us to distinguish this versus that. Gradients and Hessians will do this versus that. All right? So what, what's a metric you could maybe use to characterize this versus that? So in the back of your mind, ask yourself, so stochastic optimization, sex, stochastic gradient descent, is this an optimization algorithm or is this a sampling algorithm? It depends, right? So a lot of the theory says it's optimization because you nail something to zero and you get some result in, in, in if, if things are convex. What if they're not convex? You may not anneal to zero. You may anneal to some small level, in which case, you know, operationally, at least, it's, it's a sampling algorithm. You, know, you wander around and find all the points down here near there. All right, so, um, so how would you characterize um, you know, the large scale properties of the configuration space? So think simulated annealing. Simulated annealing, you run a Markov chain. Um, I wanna find, this is a sampling algorithm. This is an optimization algorithm. Then I change the temperature, I decrease the temperature to zero. And in some cases, I find the optimal solution. Yeah. Like, What's the difference between sampling and optimization? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I can say things, but like. Yeah. yeah. I mean, complexity theoretic people would say the answer is yes. So, the notion of incompleteness is a decision problem, not a counting problem. Sampling is basically a counting problem, so it's a different complexity class. So, that's if you're a complexity theory person. I mean, if you're an optimizer, you want you know, a point estimate or something around you. I mean, the, the form of most of the stochastic optimization is. I'm convex, and if I'm not convex, I make a claim about getting to some local optimal, which means I'm convex. I ignore the fact that something might be going on here. So I want to get here. I want to find a saddle or a minimum or something, and so I want to sample, to, uh, I want to optimize to find that. But in practice, you may not set the, uh, the, uh, you know, the learning rate or the step size down to zero, and, so, and then you, know, you may run it and, and terminate according to a different rule, and operation what you're doing is sampling. So I mean, 
you know, you can view it from a differential equation perspective and say if you have this term or that term, um, in the continuous case you're solving something, but then there's a big jump between you know, how the continuous beha uh, problem behaves and how the discrete problem behaves, which you know, you saw one example of that in the last talk, but th there's a lot of other examples in that. So um, I don't think it's a black and white question. I mean, it's, yeah. All right. All right. At this rate, I'll be done by uh, 3 p.m. on Thursday, but that's fine. <laughs> when you said this function is kind of convex yeah. because I'm sampling, right? No, no this function is kind of convex because the way I access it is with something stochastic that might watch out, wash out these bumps. It's a separate question of uh, am I sampling or whatever. But so that means uh, basically you're saying there is a convex function, which is a free energy, under my stochastic sampling algorithm. Yeah. So, so I didn't say that because I, I don't, that's not always the case, I didn't want to say that, but I, did, I, I wanted to suggest that that's as a teaser. That's what I'm understanding. Yeah, that, I wanted to suggest that as a teaser. I mean, For formalizing when, we, that, that, yeah, yeah, but. But that would mean, uh, if there is something like a free energy, that would mean there is also um, a function that projects the full dimensional parameter space into a lower dimensional space on which is free energy. <coughs> yeah, so if I'm in. Find something like this, just what you know what this low dimensional projection is? Um, sort of uh, there's, no, there's not a well-defined ensemble here. I'm not stationary. I'm feeding data through at some rate. So don't think equilibrium situation. It's got to be a little bit more non-equilibrium. There certainly is a lower dimensional structure because... The gradient descent with momentum is normal dynamics, for example. Roughly. But the modulo this continuous discrete thing, but yeah. yeah. And, and so that's what people do. I mean, they, they, they run something like that. Depends on the scale, exactly. So I want to say why it works. So I'm going to talk about not some toy thing. I want to address state-of-the-art things. When people do state-of-the-art things, they have some rule for choosing the scale. You don't generate a factor of 10 more data and keep all your parameters the same. You generate a factor of more 10 data and fiddle with all the parameters to squeeze stuff out, presumably because you're not in the case where you, know, you have some adiabatic separation of scales, right? You're not in the case where um, you know, some Gaussian limit. You're in the, you, you, know, you, you fiddle with parameters to stay not at that limit as a practical matter. So this scale question is going to be critical for what we're talking about, actually. All right. Um, so how would I measure this? So simulator annealing, the idea is that I change the temperature, and some problems I can solve um, in the sense that I, you know, I, I optimize, and some problems I don't. And um, the hello world result you might think of is if I'm a high temperature, think physics, high temperature icing model, I can wander between all the configurations sort of equally well. If I'm at a low temperature phase, uh, my spins are either a perturbative approximation of all down or a perturbative approximation of all, all up. Essentially, it's impossible to go from one to the other. Right? There's a path, but it's exponentially unlikely. So here you have a situation where um, things are all down or all up. Simulator annealing will not work. In the high temperature phase, it will work. Spin glasses are pathologically non-convex things that don't have two of those minimum, but have two to the end of those minimum. And so um, what I want to say is that the, back to why it works. It works because the training process in, in state-of-the-art computer vision natural language, you can come up with counterexamples for this, but in those cases, the training process engineers in correlations over many size scales. Your eyebrow, your eye, so one, your face to your eyebrow is a different size scale, your face to your torso. Those correlations, you know, are like a lot of other situations, you have complex systems with many degrees of freedoms and size scales, and they're well modeled by heavy-tailed random matrix theory. Think random matrix theory, but not entries in, a, in an IID Gaussian universality class, but IID heavy-tailed. And those heavy tails short-circuit the pathologies of Gaussian spin glasses, so you don't look like this or this, which are equivalent, because I have some noise in the system. I don't have two to the n minimum, they short-circuit and I get essentially a single minimum. And so everything else people are talking about is a second order bit, right? Is this, is this this or does it look slightly steeper? Is there maybe a second bump over here a little bit? And so that's what people spend time on, but this is sort of the leading order bit. So I want to try and explain that and, and the using, it's, it's going to be using physics-y ideas and the form of theory that you do in applied math and in theoretical physics is very different than you do in, in mathematical statistics or theoretical computer science. Here you're going to a limit much more akin to the thermodynamic limit. That's a very hard limit for people that do theory to deal with. So, um, so how would you justify these claims if you don't have a theorem to fall back on? All right, so the background on this work was um, <clears throat> some stuff in randomized numerical linear algebra, actually. Um, I gave a talk in this room about 15 years ago, the very first talk I gave on 
It was the second talk on randomized numerical linear algebra, so I'm known for doing randomized linear algebra stuff, if you didn't know. And so, um, so it's good to be back. So you know, you know, where does this work? Where does this not? And most of the theory there says, I'm low rank. Do a sampling or projection, I get the result. What if you're not low rank? What if your spectrum decays extremely slowly? What if I don't? Low rank means there's big things, there's small things, and there's a clean separation of scales. Random matrix theory. Surprisingly, you need very little random matrix theory here, but we need to use random matrix theory. How would a mathematician versus statistician use random matrix theory? Wigner versus people who have proven things Wigner like since then. I'm, I'm running the uh, sort of uh, tripods, of the uh, photo of the foundations of data analysis that, um, Institute at Berkeley. Um, what does it say about data, right? I mean, what we're going to be talking about is very basic questions about a class of machine learning models that violates all the assumptions that stochastic optimization, statistical learning theory, I mean, all these people make. And this is a very nice Drosophila or hydrogen atom. Who, who doesn't know what a Drosophila or hydrogen atom is? So if I, if I give a talk in a machine learning venue, people raise their hand and say, what's a Drosophila? So this is a nice Drosophila. I mean, it's a nice way to test machine learning theories to, to physical problems. Um, ultimately, we want a practical theory of, of uh, learning here, right? If you're going to build a bridge, you don't solve Schrodinger's equation. You have layers of phenomenological theory and phenomenology. So that doesn't exist in this area, basically. Understanding why it works and what would satisfy you as a form of a why question. And so the form of the why question we're going to say is we're going to posit this and then we'll predict certain things. We're going to predict that certain things exist and we're going to be able to control it in a very precise way um, and a range of other things. Okay. Um, Deeper insights into why it works, convex and not, you know, et cetera, that um, sort of machine learning theory, people would know what all those words means. And I just want better neural networks in practice. Um, say that you need to go to a desert island tomorrow, and you need to come up with some metric that will say whether the bridge that's on that island will collapse. You probably talk to a civil engineer. He'll say, look at the coefficient of this or that and don't look at these things because they don't matter. You go there tomorrow, it's possible I give you some adversarially crazy bridge and you fail, but most likely you're right. And, and if you get the answer wrong, by the way, the tiger eats you. But if you get the answer right, you can run across the bridge and, and get to safe. So, so what's the analogous question? You're gonna go to a desert island tomorrow. I'm gonna give you a new model. Let's say it's a state-of-the-art vision or, or natural language model. So state-of-the-art model, not some adversarially thing that, you know. Um, and you need to come up with a metric that will predict how well that model will do. If you ask this to a lot of um, theoretically inclined people, they'd say, well, what's the Bayesian prior on the model, and what can I say about this? So, and then if you don't get the answer right, the tiger will eat you. So you've got to come up with a number. How would you, how would you get a practical theory? Because the vast, vast minority of people in, in practice in this area do training and testing of models. The vast majority take an existing model and tweak it in some way. And so it's funny that the, the validation metric is training and testing. We'll get back to that. So we want to come up with a metric that if you were to go tomorrow and say, I need to pay $5 for every new labeled data point, is there a way I can do this? Can I answer the question I asked you without looking at any data? Right? So this is what you have in the back of my mind. So we'll get back to that. Okay, so the motivation of this was a couple things. One was a paper that came out a couple years ago that says, I see a plot like this. This is something like an energy, and this is something like a count. If you're familiar with the area, you've probably seen this figure. Um, and they said, well, this, this means that neural networks are sort of like spin glasses, and so we'll go do some stuff. And that paper's gotten a bunch of attention. Uh, they didn't validate the hypothesis that it looked like a spin glass, but, but they said, you know, it, it looked like a spin glass. We saw this. This was a joint work with Charles Martin, who's done, um, runs a, basically a uh, consultancy shop in San Francisco. And he and I had similar backgrounds in terms of chemical physics. And we said, wait, wait this is a little bit strange, right? Because take the same plot, go back 20 years, it was in black and white, because in journal of chemical physics, things were in black and white then. F here is a free energy. Here's a count. So we had to switch the labels because they, they switch labels differently. And you see exactly the same plots. And it's essentially the same thing up to some second order bits. And this was used in talking about protein folding. And to reproduce this result, you don't need a spin glass. Spin glasses are very, very complicated things. Right? So if you don't know what a spin glass is, don't ever go there. Don't use the S word in public and do something much more modest. And much more modest might be come up with a much more reasonable model, like a random energy model. So a random energy model reproduces, and it's a much less complicated thing than a pathologically non-convex configuration space. So we said this is a little bit strange because you can reproduce this result that was motivating their result with a much more modest mo model, a random energy model. And so if you don't know about random energy models, you know, think that I have a Hamiltonian and I just make the energy random. So you're diffusing a random walk on a random penalty surface. This is a, a use case for this. And this red might look like a, you know, arbitrary spin glass. Right? I, 
here or here or here or here. I can basically say nothing about what's going on in the rest of the configuration space. But here and here and here and here, especially if I smooth over the blue a little bit with my stochastic optimization, my temperature, you know, I might be able to say I, I could imagine I have a rugged convexity. So this is that picture. So can you understand how you might get sort of a funnel mechanism that would bias you towards a small number of configuration spaces? Um, okay. <clears throat> so there's an energy. This is what people write down. Um, the, and this is, you know, many layers. This is the iterated map for many layers. You train this on labeled data. This is the usual MO using backprop by minimizing um, an error. You push the data through, you get some errors, you push the error back. Um, so let's think of the, the E as, as the part of the energy landscape parameterized by unknown elements, the weight matrices and, and bias vectors. Um, all right? And so we want to make a statement about this and maybe how this depends on good data versus bad, how this depends on small data versus large, how this depends on computer vision versus natural language. And if you write it down nominally, it's non-convex, right? It has these little bumps. I don't know if it looks like this or this because I can't say anything about the large size scale, but I, can, I know it looks like this and not that. So this is true theoretically. So mathematically, it's not a, even close to convex. Um, practical question, does this matter? And the answer is no. As a practical matter, the fact that it's non-convex and has all these local matters never matters. And this has been known for a long time. So this has been known long enough that by the 2000, it worked its way into textbooks. So uh, I think there was a Lacoon, a Benji, there's a couple papers early, 92 maybe, that said, geez, we think the VC capacity of the state space is a lot less because there's a lot of local minima. Three years later, just no local minima. We just never have a problem. We run usual state-of-the-art training pr pipelines as a practical person. There's never a problem. So by 2000, so as a practical matter, what people do is, is, is don't feature engineer, they model engineer, they put all their ignorance into lots of parameters, and then drive training and test error to zero, drive training error to zero, and then add some capacity, some, some, sorry, some regularization to, uh, so you don't overfit. So there's a textbook example of, you know, you fit end data points with a polynomial kernel. Polynomial kernels are sort of very choppy kernels in some sense, um, not mathematically, but practically. So other ones are better, but you know, just drive the training error to zero and, and regularize. And there's ten ways. There's a lot of ways to regularize. So what is regularization? So the canonical example of F regularization is I want to optimize f. So I optimize f plus lambda g, where g is a lasso or a ridge or you know, any Bayesian sort of norm or whatever. Um, and you can do that, um, or you can just drop out a few of the data points or a few of the neurons. You could do 10 steps rather than 20 steps of an iterated stochastic or non-stochastic algorithm. You can vary batch size, right? In stochastic gradient descent, I, uh, the way I do that is I choose some number of data points to estimate the gradient and then I move in that direction. How many data points do I choose? So if I'm convex and I want to tether myself to convex optimization, it's always better to choose the batches larger because your variance in the estimator is less. Um, if, if I'm doing actual implementations at scale, it's always better to choose the batch sizes larger because I can take advantage of parallelization and distributivity. Um, the, it, it oversimplifies a textured landscape, but smaller batch sizes are better if you're interested in inferential objectives. And so um, batch size is a regularization parameter. It's usually thought of as an endogenous computational parameter. It's a regularization parameter. You can add noise to the data. You can add lots of stuff. Um, <clears throat> so here, getting to the scale question. So, um, what we're going to do is try and characterize this regularization, which is actually being computed. And you should think of regularization usually as being of the following form. So ridge regression is the tikhonov phillips type um, regularization. I want to solve a linear equation. It's ill-posed or singular. So I replace it with, um, I put my, uh, you know, my uh, lambda i or alpha i there. I get f plus lambda or alpha g. So I get some objective. It's L1, it's L2, it's whatever plus lambda, some norm or some type of constraint here. So this is ridge regression. If I put a one there, it's a lasso. If I put something else there, it's an SVM. If I put something else, so go to a machine learning textbook, you'll see 50 examples of this. So the usual form is an additive function, f plus lambda g, where I introduce a scale. And roughly, if you're above alpha, your signal, you're below alpha, your noise, right? I mean, there might be signal down there, but in terms of the model you're doing, I have signal plus noise. Um, and so there's a scale where I can cut in this signal, plus noise. I mean, question is that what you see empirically? We'll get to it. Um, and in this case, it softens the rank of alpha to focus on large eigenvalues, but there's other forms that you can do that. Um, theorem, 10 steps of a random walk versus 20 steps of a random walk, or versus a million steps of a random walk. I optimize Rayleigh quotient plus lambda g, where g is log debt, or g is things like this. So 
I might approximate the solution insofar as the spectrum decays, but I also compute a regularized version of the solution. So this is true more generally, and, and so we'll see that that's going to be the case. So we can come up with a theorem in a very simple setting. What we want to do is, is adopt uh, that MO in, in situations where you have 50 layers and lots of nonlinearities and lots of more complex stuff going on. So here's the energy landscape. One way to apply regularization, remember with W are the weights matrices, is they're changing. They're the, uh, I don't know if it was X or beta in the last slide, but they're, uh, they're X. They're the solution that I'm looking for. They're the generalizations. So these are the weight matrices. These are the things that I'm training in a model. Um, different types of regularization. I put an L1 or an L2 or different norms. You know, may leave different empirical signatures on W. So say I'm code. You want to know what I'm solving. You send me, I'm not going to tell you what I'm solving, but you send me inputs and I give you the answer. So I'm solving linear equations with something. If I always return to you a solution that's sparse, you might say, oh, he's solving L1 lasso, L1 regulation. You look inside my code, I call an L1 solver. You might say, oh, the solution's always spread out and sort of, you know, you, maybe you're solving ridge regression. You look at my code, oh, it's, it's calling, calling CVX or LAPEC ridge regression. You might, I might always give you a sparse answer. You say, oh, you're solving lasso, you know, L1 regression. You look at my code, and my code's a spaghetti code. It's a mess. You're still right. I just am a poor programmer. You're still right, right? So characterize in an a posteriori way the problem that you're solving. And so we want to come up with metrics that will characterize that. And so the way we want to do it is to turn off all regularization. We can't quite do that because every knob is essentially regularization parameters, but this is the aim. Systematically turn it back on, maybe with an alpha, maybe by changing batch size, maybe by doing other things. Study empirical signatures of W. One at a time, we're going to run a controlled experiment. Was there a question? Uh, you, you were saying that Based on the outside, you're doing some kind of truncated Yeah. Right. So, um, I, the question is, where do you want to truncate this? If there was no natural, like, part in the spectrum where there were a bunch of uh, um, eigenvectors that were explaining a whole lot versus a whole yep. other set of them that are explaining very clearly. Yeah, how do you choose where to, tr yeah. Um, there's a range of answers to that. One answer is I want to prove a theorem, and so I, um, I, I either prove a theorem that punts on that question, and so I say that's a model selection question for any, you know. Um, another thing is I want to prove a theorem, and I'm going to fold that model selection into whatever result I get. Um, and of course, then there's 50 different model selection rules. You can choose any of them. There's a million different ones. A different answer is I'm a practical guy. I want to do a better job predicting puppy dogs because that's what's going to make I mean, my return on investment next quarter. And so I'm going to answer that question in a way that I don't even know how I'm answering it, because I'm going to run the same MO. I'm going to squeeze out stuff. I don't even know that I'm solving implicitly a regularization, but if I adjust batch size to be this or that, that's what I'm doing. If I adjust learning rate to be this or that. Now, clearly, there's certain computational constraints here. If batch size 127 is the optimal batch size, or well, 129 is the optimal batch size, maybe it sets, makes sense to round that up to 128 for computational reasons, right? So, but um, um, I can tell you how what the, our results suggest people in this area would do that in practice, and, and the answer is they just squeeze until they ran out of time, which is basically the MO. But we're going to be able to come up with a metric that says, should you squeeze longer or not, for example. Okay. Um, so what happens to lay, layer weight matrices? So, um, we don't want to evaluate this on one or two models. We want to evaluate on 50. I want to talk about 10. We've evaluated on you know, hundreds since then. Um, we're going to do very little retraining. We'll retrain a few things to test our hypotheses. The reason we don't want to retrain is training's hard, right? I mean, I, I could spend an hour here talking about tr state-of-the-art training. It's very hard. Um, we don't want to retrain here also because it's not reproducible. Right? I mean, there's 50 knobs going on here, any one of which could affect your training. And even if I give you my code, it's, not, it's incompatible with PyTorch or TensorFlow from a year ago. And so, I mean, it's not. So if we want to ask a scientific question, let's work with a stationary target. Let's work on state-of-the-art models. There are, a year ago, dozens, now hundreds of computer vision models. There are now order 10 natural language models that are state-of-the-art, not some toy thing. State-of-the-art by the metrics downstream people care about. What makes them work? Right? You want to know how build bridge works, you don't do something here, you look at, at the Golden Gate. Right? So um, I want to know how a state of the art performs. And so we'll do that, and then we'll validate it here. So um, Alex met Inception, so on. Okay. <coughs> Preliminary results. So three layer MLP. Um, we, we saw this plot. 
and this, this is a matrix entropy, which is an entropy of singular values. This is going down. F fully connected layer one and two goes down, goes down. Is this a real effect? It looks pretty good, right? Of course, that's 0.92 to 0.91. Seems a lot more modest when I tell you what the scales are. Um, you can look at matrix rank, it's similar. Um, so is this it was clear something was going on there, but how real is real? Um, we looked at ski, scree plots. The reason I'm looking at eigenvalues, we also looked at eigenvectors, but eigenvalues are what defines something to be low rank. And so there's a lot of a posteriori sort of capacity control metrics that, that, are, that are soft versions of I'm low rank or I'm high rank. Um, but scree plots, you know, the order of the eigenvalues and how they decrease say basically nothing. I mean, you know, they, of course they go down and to the right. So now I look at this and this is one of the exceptional cases where we actually look at training. Red is what I saw before. Blue is what you see at the beginning of training. Blue is what you see at the end of training. Boom, boom. So we're looking at eigenvalues. Um, well, here's singular values because I'm square, but most of the later things would be eigenvalues. And we saw this, and we, this is, you know, we knew we were onto something big here. So what's going on here? So why is the initial semicircular, quarter circular? Hmm? So Wigner semicircle. So as a practical matter, people train with random matrices, Gaussian random matrices. There's glow rot normalization, but that's a second order effect, right? So they're random matrices. So this says you're random to begin with. That's just a sanity check. That's not any deep insight into what's going on. At the end of training, we see this. Boom. So there's a question about, you know, where is the scale of the fluctuation? We're well outside that. This is bulk plus by. So this, something's going on here. This is a signal. If you look at it through eigenvalues rather than singular values, you don't see anything. So you've got to look at it through the right lens. You look at it through the right lens. This is a Wigner semicircle. It's quarter circle, for, but this is a Wigner semicircle, right? So we said, boom. I mean, that's remarkable. So what's going on there more generally? And by the way, this is how we implement it. It's really five lines of code. It's totally reproduced. I mean, this is not, it, these matrices are 500 by 1,000. I mean, do the, do the uh, inefficient thing if you want. I mean. Uh, we, we've done PCI on terabytes of data. I mean, this is five lines, so this is not. Um, look at training. Again, your three-layer MLP, so about as toys you can get. Random. After four epochs, boom, you get this. After 40 epochs, you get this. That's four, that's three. So this pulls out pretty quickly. You run a factor of 10 longer, it gets marginally better. You could run a factor of 10 longer, I'd be in the next campus down, right? It'd be marginally better. So there's a, there's a diminishing returns, but people spend a lot of their time there. So can we understand what's going on? So the 101, 102, 103 for random matrix theory. We spent all that time worrying about the next three slides because you know you, when you're making broad claims, you got to know. But so if you've seen this, I'll give you a hint. If you haven't seen this, this is a, this is a different perspective on it. But it's it's random matrix results. So the 101 is Wigner. So Wigner is a, the statement. It, it's like the matrix version of of the you know the law central limit theorem when you get 500,000 heads if you do a million flips. Um, look at the eigenvalues of a random matrix. The entries are iid random. Um, they take this shape. It's a semicircle. So you saw the quarter circle version of this. Um, so there's a bulk statement that they look like this. And then there's an edge statement. You get some fluctuations around the edge because it's not always going to cut off exactly there. It might be slightly above or slightly below. So we're interested in both things, bulk and edge. Um, and Wigner is very robust. You see that shape at, for matrices of 100 by 100. You don't need to be large, OK? Um, so that's the 101 in random matrix theory. The 102 is um, what if your matrices aren't square? that's actually a square matrix. If your matrices aren't square, let W be an n by n random matrix. Look at xx transpose. So we're going to look at singular values or eigenvalues, and we're being careful about that. This is a function. This is not a semicircle, but it's a well-defined function. And the shape of that function looks like this, or this, or this, or this, or this, or this, depending on the values of the parameters. So it's not a semicircle, but in some regime, it looks a little bit like one. But um, it's a well-defined function. And Theorem, you know, that's called marchenko pasteur You go to that limit. It's the same as Wigner, except it's a rectangular case. There's a cutoff there. There's a, there's a tracy widom edge effect, and you're, you're never out there. So we're interested in the bulk shape, which depends on the aspect duration, the variance. So there's a bulk shape, and there's an edge effect. That's 102. Um, 103. So depending if your background's in physics, you might use random matrices theory sort of phenomenologically. In math, you want to prove theorems. Um, Wigner came out in 1954, 55. Um, since then, there's been a bunch of physics-y stuff, a bunch of math-y stuff, a bunch of statistics, a lot of follow-up. The heavy-tailed random matrix theory results were, also came out in physics. People actually doing finance, basically in the 90s. 
Um, we had to steal those ideas, 95 to 2019, the last 25 years. Um, some reasonable subset of that's been mathematized in a theorem form. Um, so I'm going to gloss over those details, but the, the rough answer is um, what's going on here. Um, if you're Gaussian random variables, you get basic marchenko pester Gaussian, marchenko pester in the limit you look like MP, tracy Witham fluctuations, no tail. If you're a rank three perturbation of that, rank five perturbation, yeah, um, it's called the spiked covariance model. Gaussian plus low rank perturbations. You get marchenko pester plus a few spikes that stick out. MP in the limit, tracy Witham fluctuations. So it's, it's essentially the same. It's a perturbative variant of that. Um, you can also have heavy, and, and this is very robust, right? Anything that looks Gaussian will give you this, a Gaussian universality class. If you're heavy tailed, so now it depends whether you're levy or power law, and so this is parameterized as a power law, where your pa parameter is mu. There's three, well, there's more than three regimes, but for us, there's three regimes. Four between two and four and less than two. If you're greater than four, um, it's probably not such a good model, but you have four moment conditions, and so you get one set of results. You actually get marchenko pasteur in the limit, you get heavy tailed bulk sort of uh, edge effects. So you get non perturbative corrections on, on the limit here and here. And so this is, so, so, so your limiting behavior is different than your finite end behavior. And your finite end behavior, you see size scale 100,000, 10,000, 100. I mean, so you never see the limit. So the finite size effects, if you're very heavy tailed, so smaller mu means you're going to be more heavy tailed. If you're very heavy tailed, um, then, what, then, then you, you, you're the, you, what you see, you're dominated by the largest entries, and so that manifests itself directly in the eigenvalue. So that's a much easier regime to deal with because you're basically in that limit. Um, if you're between two and four, you can guess where all the interesting results are. Right? So if you're between two and four, um, you're moderately heavy-tailed. Sometimes they call it fat-tailed. You get power law on the empirical spectral distributions. The value of the parameters may be different than the underlying model because of the finite size corrections. You do not have an edge because you go out forever. You could ask about truncated power law fits, and you get uh, fresh A local statistics. So um, all this is to say um, we did our homework and, and talk to me offline if you're interested, but there's a rich texture here, and we're interested in the heavy-tailed properties. This is easy. Signal, there's a scale. There's the edge. You're either above the edge or below the edge. You're either signal plus noise. Here, there's no scale to cut. All right. So fitting heavy-tailed distributions is hard. I'm not going to put up log log fits where you see a line, because you never see that unless, unless your power law parameter is 1. So that's a very bad diagnostic to use. Um, and this sort of illustrates that a lot of finite size effects, very non-trivial to, to do these things. But we stole results not from mathematical statistics. We stole results from physicists who went to finance. This is a business you can become a billionaire if you're right 51% of the time. Right? You just need control on that downside risk. And so you tend to ask different questions when you want to control that downside risk and get a, a limit theorem. So we are using these ideas. So more detailed results. So we want to know why deep learning works. And so we want to look at state-of-the-art computer vision and natural language models. Um, Lynette 5 is a model that was state-of-the-art 20 years ago for doing character recognition. And then there was a transformation in 2012, 2013, and there's a bunch of stuff since then. These are computer vision. Um, in the last three or four years, two or three years, there's a, more, a lot more natural language models that are out there. Um, and these tend to be, you know, extremely big, and you t tend to spend, I mean, obscene amounts of, of uh, CPU and GPU time to train them. Here's a table to illustrate some numbers that I'll be putting up in a second. Lynette 5, state-of-the-art 20 years ago. The red is going to be the best MP fit, the best marchenko pasteur fit. We now have it automated. Then we didn't, but boom, 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 boom. This is a 5, 12 by 1,000, whatever matrix. There's 10 eigenvectors. Is this one, should this one be in the bulk or not? I don't know. That one isn't. So the, this, the Tracy Wadden fluctuations are about that size scale. Yeah? This is one layer. So when I said first fully connected, second fully connected, those are two layers. We don't have a, a way to characterize all the layers together, so we're pulling out different layers. Um, the theory works a little bit better on fully connected layers because the convolutions, you could imagine, is going to screw up the local correlations that are going to be important. For we actually see better results on a lot of natural language models, especially ones that are a little bit more mature. But th this isn't, these slides are about eight months old. So um, zoom in. I mean, that's a perfect fit. I mean, that's a great fit, right? Um, Essentially, every model post-2013 looks like this. Is that a good fit? Bleeding out. So zoom in. This is uh, FC3, that's FC1. Look at this. Bleeds out. It actually bleeds out to way up here. This is a very bad fit. I mean, there's a lot of mass that's clearly not random. And it's right here. There's two things going on. One, the bulk's off. Two, the edge is off. Here, the edge, you, know, you come down, boom. 
I mean, it might be a question about one or two things there, but you come down, there's a sharp edge and there's stuff that sticks out. Here the edge is totally bleed. So if you look at this in a log-log plot, you get something suggestive, but those plots are so misrepresentative that I'm not going to put them up. So if you look at log-log and semi-log, this is pretty well approximated by a heavy tail. I don't know what the value is. It's on that table. It's two and a half, roughly. Um, I could show you 50 other plots that look like that. One of the exceptions is actually inception V3, where you see something like this, but you actually see a dip right there. I mean, this is what you see on, on one of the layers, see a dip. So this sort of suggests the model's under-optimized, you know, under-trained, and so you could train some more. This is usually a signature that people grafted two models together and didn't fully optimize it. So um, think of this as a canonical example. Very poor MP fit, both in the bulk and in the edge, and you get a lot of mass bleeding out, and the mass goes up to 20 or 25 there. All right, so we want to we want to understand why this works. So the reason we're looking at heavy tails is I want to distinguish this versus this. Eigenvalues are global things. You might hope they can distinguish this from this. I haven't promised that, but we might. So these are not Hessians and gradients that can distinguish this from this or this from this. We want to distinguish this from this, and we want to look at the large scale eigenvalue structure. So this is very coarse information. This is the leading order, but why it works, not the fine scale. And we want to distinguish this or that. I don't know the difference between this and that. All right, so, um, so I showed you a bunch of results. The quarter circle thing made us look at through this, the lens of eigenvalues. I showed you some stuff on the heavy-tailed random matrix theory 101, 102, 103. Um, some initial empiric results. The empiric results suggest that Lynette 5 behaves one way, pretty good, well approximated by MP. Um, everything since 2013 behaves a different way, more heavy-tailed. All right, so here's, here's, here's a phenomenological theory. So what does the word theory mean? So I'm using theory now in a scientific sense of the word. You know, quantum mechanics theory, Darwin's theory, not in um, VC theory, not in stochastic optimization theory. Right? Th this is mathematics. So here I want to come up with a theory. It's going to be a phenomenological theory. So I want to say something about bridges, right? I want to come up with some parameters of a state-of-the-art model. You know, AlexNet, this isn't a two-layer. So, so parameters that could tell me if you got to take some parameter and go to the desert island tomorrow, um, what are you going to you know, measure? And so the theory is going to be based on random matrix theory. And the idea is I'm trying to squeeze a little bit of signal out of noise. And maybe during the training process, I do a better or worse job of that. And so the theory based on heavy tail, you know, random matrix theory 101, 102, 103 is going to be here are possible end states of learning. Think of it as phases in a phase diagram. So this isn't a unique thing. It's, it's a whole phase. One could be random-like. The bulk behaves this way, the edge is like this. Two could be a little bit of bleeding out. The bulk behaves this way, I have a little bit of stuff going on here. Three is bulk plus spike, I have a bulk plus spikes. So really this, is, this interpolates between the two. But it interpolates between, if you were to go from random like to bulk plus spikes, they would bleed out this way, you'd have an edge. Um, four is that you start to have this sort of bulk decay. You're really degrading the quality of the bulk, pulling more stuff out. You may or may not have this thing sticking out, but eventually more things pull out in, in, in a heavy-tailed way. And so if you have one thing here, is this a spike or is this a fluctuational effect? And that's a modeling question. And then you can be heavy-tailed. And heavy-tailed just isn't a vague sense of, oh, I have a few things that are large. I mean, it's reasonably well fit to a power law fit with parameters between two and four. And then you can have a degenerate case of, of rank collapse in certain cases, which you also see. Um, so um, that's, those are pictures. This is a table to illustrate the same thing. You know, your random like, the ESD is well fit with the appropriate scale. Above that, your signal. Below that, your noise, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the bulk decay, the heavy tail, these, these are a little bit more subtle because I need to get into the details of random matrix theory. We're positing these things as if they exist. As a practical matter, what we're doing is running a particular set of procedures, a particular set of experiments that compute the heavy tailed exponents in a particular way. We think we're pretty robust to that, but you know, future work. But we're pretty robust to that, I think. And so we're going to taxonomize it this way. Lots of technical issues. OK. Bulk plus spike. Well fit, boom, some spikes. Smaller odled models can be perturbed by Gaussian random matrix theory, perturbatively, right? If, if this, it was not the three layer MLP, but it was fitting MNIST with something, cut there, keep this. I'd get 95% prediction quality ballpark on MNIST. So is 95% prediction quality good or bad on MNIST? Bad. It's better than 10%. It's, okay, I, I can tweak primers making 90. I don't know what a linear model is. A linear model is 92, isn't it? It's 92, I would have said. So it's better than, okay, so I can tweak primers to make it 96. I thought linear model is 92. 
So it's better than 10%, it's better than 92. It's worse than 99.8. So to go from 10 to 95, I keep eight eigenvectors. To go from 95 to 99.8, I need to look at the other 492 eigenvectors. So this signal there, sorry, but you know, most of it's up here. But you know, this is, this is in statistics what you would have as a spiked covariance model. There's a scale, this is taken off regularization, except it's not the L2 term, but it, you know, there's a scale. Above that scale, your signal, below that scale, your noise. This is a traditional form of regularization. So you can put regularization in at weights at 10 different points. What I'm saying is the actual model I get at the end, pull out a layer, <coughs> this is what I see. So the, you, know, you look inside the code, I don't have a nice clean solver for calling a uh, F plus lambda G. This is what I computed by this and other metrics of a posteriori regularization. All right. What you see in everything post-2013 is not that. You don't get that clean cut. Um, so, and, and it's not surprising that you may do it. I mean, W is your weight matrix. It's strongly correlated and highly non-random. So the question is, can we model strongly correlated systems by heavy-tailed random matrices? So here's a way to talk about how proteins fold that um, I and Charles knew from years ago. It's good enough to get qualitative properties. It's not good enough to be quantitatively precise. But um, a pr if you're a math person, you might say a protein's like a self-avoiding random walk, and you know, just, it's a random walk. And they say, oh, it gets, but it doesn't step on its own toes. So it's a self-avoiding random walk. But then you say, no, not quite, because if you look at aggregate statistics here, they're pretty different. And if you know about proteins, there's a correlation every 3.4 amino acids, because it's an alpha helix. There's a correlation on size scale 10 or 20, because it's a beta sheet. There's cor correlations on size scale hundreds with tertiary structure. So how do you model this? And so one way people have modeled this and other systems that have correlations over many size scales is using heavy-tailed random matrix theory. Um, saying that, that I don't know what the penalty surface of the state-of-the-art protein is, but I, I can model it phenomenologically. And, and think of a protein as different than a random heteropolymer. A protein, if you denature it by heating it up and you cool it down, and you do that again, you'll get back to the same state. You do that again, you get back to the same state. You do, that, you do that a thousand times, you always get back to the same state. There's one or two proteins that are the exception that proves this rule. You always go up and down to the same state. You take a random heteropolymer, that's not the case. You heat it up, cool it down, you get a different conversion. Heat it up, cool it down, different Age of the universe, you never see the same thing twice. Why? Because if you have a random heteropolymer, this is what the configuration space looks like. It's essentially you're, you've, you're either at or crossed over. I see that you know, there's finite size effects. So either at or crossed over into a spin glass space. So you, you look like this. I don't know or care what the local properties look like. I mentioned the global structure. Um, but you know, essentially, nature has engineered proteins to have this sort of rugged convexity. So the, con the claim here is that you know, neural networks are essentially um, strongly correlated systems for which an analogous modeling will hold. So um, this uses the random matrix theory and the marchenko pasteur ESDs that have heavy tails. And we're just stealing those results, essentially. So large model DNNs exhibit this heavy-tailed self-regularization. So no single scale threshold. No simple low rank approximation with a signal separating by noise at this size scale. You really get contributions from many size scales. Those are very hard things to model. So we're using the random matrix theory to model signal, not noise. Um, and there's not a perturbative approximation. So think disordered system theory in physics, but like liquid phase or proteins, not, not solid phase or an icing model. And in an icing model, you're typically, the, the form of the theory is I want to be a perturbative approximation of the lattice state, right, the zero temperature state, with it's, it's a lattice. And so this is what's going on here. Um, we can look at eigenvectors and lots of other things to justify that. Okay, so um, let me finish up by saying w one thing about varying a batch size um, and one thing about our different use. So varying the batch size. So batch size is usually thought of as an endogenous computational parameter. It's gotten a lot of interest recently. Um, so um, a theory should make predictions. We posited these things exist, right? Do they exist? Because I've shown you two. I showed you Lynette 5, and I showed you one of 50 more recent ones. Um, we posited five phases. Do these exist? And there's many, many knobs here in the train process. If I can show you that all five phases exist by fiddling with endless knobs, that's not such a compelling reason, right? That, that could be a false discovery issue, right? So can I exhibit all the phases by changing one knob? And so the answer will be yes. I can, I can do it with lots of knobs, batch size, I mean, with learning rate and training rate and other knobs that correlate with temperature. I'm going to do it with batch size here. So we're going to change the batch size from large to small. Remember, convex theory people and distributed data systems people want large batch sizes for two different reasons. Um, statisticians and machine learners have pointed out that you know, small batch size oftentimes is better in terms of inferential gains. I don't know if large or small is good. It's a trade-off space. We're going to tune the batch size. Um, now we're actually retraining. So this is one of the, the only other place where we're training. And um, we're only going to change one knob. 
So if your goal is to do good prediction, we're going to be suboptimal. But if your goal is to understand something, this is, a, this is a control. We're changing one knob. And large batch sizes decrease generalization accuracy. Small batch, large batch sizes, what we'll see is they lead to better implicit self-regularization. Um, so large batches are going to be worse by generalization accuracy. That's known. We reproduce that. And they're going to correspond to less well-regularized models. Not because you put in a large or smaller value of a regularization parameter, because when you squeezed and squeezed and squeezed and look at these eight-part stereometrics, that's what pops out. So um, this is a funny plot because you need to look at it backwards and upside down. Um, there's a couple different notions of maybe the next plot's easier to. You know. There's a couple different notions of um, low rankness. I can look at entropy as stable rank. There's a couple different notions of generalization quality. Here we're going from large to small and log scale from poor to good. So let me, you know, just in the interest of time, not going through the specifics. We, we set something at size scale 1,000 and we change the batch size. What you see is the training and test diverge, but that's because we're changing one knob. We're not changing knobs to pull those back together. Um, what we see is that the model becomes more implicitly self-regularized. It's lower rank by um, soft rank, by stable rank, by range of metrics. Um, so I could show you a table of numbers. I mean, I could show you what the ESD looks like in batch size 500, 250, random like 100, 32, bulk plus spike, 16, bulk plus spike with some bleeding out, 8, bulk plus spike with more bleeding out. Um, the original version I s saw stopped here. I said, no, no, keep going. <laughs> Come on, you. 4, no, no, keep going. Two, boom. And so the transition wouldn't happen between four and two in other models. It could happen elsewhere. We could saturate and never see this, but we could have that transition at 32 or somewhere else. So what we can see is by changing just one knob, we can exhibit all of these phases of learning. And clearly, if we want to optimize more, we could do more. How do you apply the theory? There's a lot of technical details. Uh, most of these were computer vision, actually. In computer vision, there's lots of models out there to look at. Um, Natural language, and, and I mention this because if you think of this as a Drosophila, computer vision is modeled between 2013 and now. It's, it's a relatively mature area in a sense. If you have a theory that shouldn't depend on the details of the computer vision versus the natural language versus applying this to a physical system, which we want these methods not to be, um, how would it apply? And so we put this up about a year ago. Now there's you know, order 10 natural language models that are BERT, which is a, a state-of-the-art model that's obscenely large, and a range of sort of improvements to that. Um, how would we perform? Um, and I don't have the full figure here. What you see is with, um, with BERT, if you looked at the distribution of, of um, power locks months, you'd see that behave one way. And there's a more mature version now where they're all shifted to the left. So that's significant because that would be a prediction of the theory. Smaller parallel exponents should correlate with better generalization, right? Because it, it, it's going to mean that you concentrate information in this more tightly and better. And, and so that's what you see with the models now versus a year ago. Um, you look at however many layers. Um, this is 5,000. This is some number of layers. 90% have exponents typically between 2 and 4. Um, models that have exponents out here tend to be just less well fit, meaning you know, the heavy tail is not a good model, bug plus spike is not a good model, nothing's a particularly good model. There's a few things that are less than two, but the vast majority are between two and maybe four. So this is a very sort of universal phenomenon, no pun intended. Um, how do you use a theory? So let's go to a desert island. <laughs> and we would want to say that this generalization theory, meaning people that do VC type machine learning theory, Say one way to control generalization is not just the v, something called the VC dimension, but also norms. Now, why would a norm, a weight layer having small norm, correspond to better generalization? Now, one answer might be like ridge regression. You know, you don't allow yourself ridiculous cancellations. Well, that gets very tricky because here you're in overparameterized models. Um, what does that mean? That's, that's the, the essence of it. Here you're, here you're like least squares where you're very rectangular this way. And so you can have sort of a double descent in the, in the prediction curve. So sort of, but I mean, a, a more mundane reason why the norm could be small is that norms are relatively easy to, to compute. I fold the norm in as a regularizer during training. And of course, smaller norms are better because I fold it into the training process. That's a, that's a more mundane, and that's in fact what happens. So we said basically we're going to look at norms, 
and, and no one has applied norm-based metrics to state-of-the-art models. They've applied it to toy things where the theory would apply, but nothing to state-of-the-art. How well do, um, does this work? And it does reasonably well. So x is test accuracy, y is an average log norm. You've got to do it in log scale and take the, the average. And it does reasonably well. Not great, but this is, this is a metric you could take to the desert island and, and it, you know, you'd, there's a good chance you would, the tiger wouldn't get you. Um, we use the ideas from the heavy-tailed random matrix theory, knowing that smaller power law exponents would co correspond to better generalization, at least phenomenologically, um, and using the, this idea of universality, which is much less robust for these heavy-tailed systems than Gaussian universality, to say, um, if we're going to come up with a metric, it should be reasonably robust to the exact value of the power law and derived a heuristic argument based on, on very small exponents, power law exponents, and said, you know, imagine we want to just take the average power law, the average fitted power law. That actually does reasonably well. That does a little bit worse than the norms, but that does reasonably well. You may be able to escape the tiger with that. Um, but now there's some layers that are larger and some are smaller, and there's finite size effects, and we're not really just fitting a power law, we're trying to fit a, uh, a weighted power law. So let's try and weight, and what should these weights be? And the, the argument would, the, the universality-based argument would say that should essentially be the log of a spectral norm, a size scale. So now we have a two-parameter model where it's not just the amount of stuff, the norm, but a size and a shape parameter. The size and, and shape being the scale of the largest eigenvalue, which is a norm, it's a spectral norm, and the, uh, the power law exponent, which says sort of how much does information concentrate. Um, alpha log lambda max should be log of the weight matrix. Um, a bunch of the outliers that you saw before fit much more cleanly. You have a much cleaner relationship here. This is in the VGG series. This is in the ResNet series. I could show you a bunch of others. Um, there's a few exceptions to this. You know, the tiger may get you, so the bridge may come down, but this weighted power law metric, both in the computer vision models, we put this up a year ago, so the natural language models didn't exist. Compute them now. Um, does a good job there. Does a better job now than the, the natural language models a year ago, but that's because the models are getting more mature in time. You push a first model out, it's okay. Over time, you squeeze more correlations out, it gets better, exactly what we'd predict. So more general implications as to why this is going to work. And here's the, uh, the protein sort of analogy, right? Random heteropolymer, you have a random weight matrix. You could test this. What if I take all my input data and I randomize all the labels? I could randomize, there's still some residual structure because the images may have. I could randomize all the pixels in the images and I run a training, right, I could do this. You get something more like this. Why? Because all the power locks once get larger and just much worse fits. You're gonna look like something like this. You train to more data, better quality data, you're gonna look something like this. Which is just the energy landscape funnel from some sort of protein folding ideas. Um, so this is actually another picture, although we had to modify it a little bit from something in Journal of Chemical Physics in the, in the 90s. Um, this is the same plot. This is, this is an energy and an entropy. S is an entropy, it's a count. This is an energy and an entropy, right? The large eigen, how, why did Wigner introduce random matrix theory? There's a bunch of random stuff and a few good low-lying states. This is random IID, I don't know anything. We're doing the same thing. There's a bunch of random stuff and a good few low-lying states. But now maybe some of the good stuff bleeds down and some of this, you know, and so you get a heavy-tailed structure over here. So this is, you know, you have a bulk, you're degrading the bulk, you have some spikes. So I just flipped the axis there. So this is exactly that. And so, um, so why it works. So we haven't formalized this in this context. Chazot and Bouchard, these are some of the people from the uh, 90s who are doing the animation theory. How would you even justify a claim like this? Because here, this is an awkward thing to claim in terms of complexity theory, because you can always find some corner case. These are intractable things to compute. So in a sense, you're replacing one intractable thing with another and making a modeling claim in terms of heavy detailed random matrix theory. One way to formalize it is do minima, local minima, in the zero temperature, to the extent this is a zero temperature penalty surface, do they concentrate near the ground state? So here, this is the global minimum. How many states do I have slightly above the global minimum? When I get slightly above the global minimum, boom, two to the n, because I have two to the n of these. How many minima here do I have slightly above the global minimum? Just a little bit, just a little bit. Just, so if you look at the entropy as a function of how far you're above the ground state, there's nothing like ground state, and then boom, gets huge, or increases very, very gradually. So, um, so that's the claim. So if the energy landscape is more funneled, you're not going to have these problems. Um, the claim is this is why state-of-the-art neural networks work. Um, if you don't like what I've said, go prove me wrong. And I think even formulating this hypothesis and making these claims in a falsifiable way is much better than most people in the area do. So believe me, because I think we've justified it, or prove me wrong, but I think that's an advance in the state of the art. 
Um, and I think you know, we have here is a qualitative understanding of what's going on, phenomenological theory. If your goal is to do a better job predicting um, classification of cats and dogs, you'd use this in one way for better training. If your goal is to say, geez, you know, and I have a system and I have some physical insight, I might not want to squeeze every last little bit of correlation out of my prediction accuracy. I might want to back off and you know, have a model where the spikes stick out a little bit further because they correspond more to the, uh, the natural coordinates you, know, you heard about with, from Laplace and eigenmaps and these techniques. Um, so I think the way you'd use this is very different than those two use cases and we have results on using this in both of those use cases, but um, I think it's lunchtime, so I'll tell you over lunch if, 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 if you want to know. Thank <laughs> you.